Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. May the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, the Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. That verse speaks of the cooperation between the sinner and our Lord Jesus Christ. That question that our Lord poses to all of the apostles, who do men say that I am? We give them various answers. And then, but who do you say that I am? Who do you, my followers, my apostles, who do you say that I am? Not just men, but who do you say that I am? And you would think that the apostles who have all walked with Jesus at the same time, they've all seen the same things, that they'd all go, oh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The only Peter. So you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And our Lord responds, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, when we look at that, we go, well, that's really good for Peter. No, it's really good for each and every one of us. But it also puts us on notice. And that notice is that we must cooperate with the graces that our Lord Jesus Christ shows us. You look at the varying ways that this man, Jesus Christ, has presented himself to people. The reaction of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is one thing. They hate him with all their being. They are going out of their way to plan and will ultimately come to, it will come to fruition for them that they will be able to kill him because they despise him so much. His apostles, there are 12 of them. How come only one? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. It's not to badmouth the other 11 but it is to show the graces that our Lord Jesus Christ and his Father have showed upon Simon Barjona, the one upon whom the church is going to be built. And he responds, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You have three categories of response. Pharisees, Sadducees, his apostles who, oh, maybe I'm embarrassed to say this. I might think it, but you know, I don't want to go this far and say you're the Son of God. Why does Peter open his mouth? because of his cooperation with the grace that our Lord Jesus Christ. They've all seen the same miracles. They've all heard the same teachings. They all know who he is. They all know what he claims. Three completely different categories of response to the same thing. We are the same exact way. This is why I say that it's so very important for us to be thankful that we're, for instance, sitting here. But with sitting here comes a tremendous responsibility. And that tremendous responsibility is cooperating with the graces of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now when I say the graces of our Lord Jesus Christ, I do not mean some abstract, you know, this teaching, that teaching, or anything. It is embracing the truth of what is said, what is seen, what is received, what is said in Mass. Just like Sadducees and Pharisees, the apostles who remain silent, and St. Peter who says that you are the Christ and Son of the living God, we can all find ourselves in that category depending on how we cooperate with the graces of Christ. And the graces of Christ that I want to focus on are the, are the graces that he shows us in Holy Mass. You will hear regularly, if not to your discomfort, the amount of times that I harp on the, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. This is not the communion meal, that's a Protestant term. It is not a reenactment of the Last Supper. There are elements of those things in it, but it is first and foremost, and primarily, the sacrifice of the Mass. Because every time we get together, you might not hear a homily, but our Lord Jesus Christ is sacrificed 
that sacrifice that he did in a bloody way, once for all on Calvary, is brought into reality on our altars. Now, there are myriad people who are in mass right this moment across the face of this planet who, yeah, I go there every Sunday, and they're hearing things, and they're seeing things, and it's like, whatever, we're done, let's move on, let's go to Sonny's, okay? That's not our approach. Our approach should be ever being attentive to the Mass, because our attention at the Mass is that act of cooperation with the graces of our Lord Jesus Christ. And where I want to go with this today is a specific part in the Mass. Because I love when we, when we can bring up something in the Mass, and particularly the traditional manifestation of the Mass, when it deepens our understanding profoundly about what's going on, if you just pay attention. But the only way you can really pay attention to it is if you know, if somebody teaches you, just like our Lord Jesus Christ, he taught the Pharisees and Sadducees, his apostles and Peter, that you have this plethora of reactions to the same exact teaching. The place I want to go to the Mass today is, they are words from the second reading, the last portion of the 11th chapter of the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, where he says, for him and by him and in him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Okay, that was the second reading. What does that have to do with Mass? For him and by him and in him. Now the prepositions change up a little bit because English translations of what was said in the Greek can vary. But we hear it in the Mass, if, you haven't, if it hasn't clicked yet, by him and with him and in him. We hear that every single time we come to Mass. It is, if not the, one of the most profound portions of the sacrifice of the Mass. Those words that St. Paul gives us in Romans, for him and by him and in him are all things. That is what is referred to as a doxology. A thanksgiving. It's one of those churchy words that we read in the bullet and read it. Yep, doxology. Okay, doxology. Because the doxology can run a gamut. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. That is a doxology. The Gloria is a doxology. The Te Deo that we say occasionally in Mass is a doxology. There are a bunch of doxologies. Those are doxologies, and they are glorious, and they are grand, and they give praise to God, but they are of human origin. These words for, uh, of him and by him and in him that St. Paul give us, those are the Holy Spirit's words. Those are words that are given supernaturally to St. Paul to be laid down in Scripture for us. Of him and by him and in him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. It's a divine presentation of thanksgiving to God. When God really wants us to do something perfect for him, he gives us the words with which to do it. These, if you're going to give thanks to God, you should use these words. Because this doxology has given, been given to us by the Holy Spirit. It is divine. Words of Scripture are perfect. They are grace-filled. There is no imperfection. I'm not saying that there's any imperfection in anything man-made, but it's man-made. And men are corrupted and sinful. So there may be something lacking. The words of our Lord never, never is it lacking. This doxology that Paul gives us, he gives it to us at the end of chapter 11, if you want to use the chapter and verse numbers that we have put into the scriptures to make it easier to follow along. For three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, Paul has been talking about Jews and Gentiles. There has been so much ink spilled over what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 9 through 11. What does it mean about the Jews? Are they served differently? Are they in abeyance? Or, you know, all these kind of questions between Jews and Gentiles. 
And the bottom line on Paul's whole presentation is it doesn't matter if you are a Jew. It doesn't matter if you are a Gentile. You're all disobedient. You're all disobedient and you need my grace to be saved. That's succinctly what Paul is saying. Doesn't matter if you're Jew. Doesn't matter if you're Gentile. You can't claim to be a child of Abraham. We can't claim to be baptized Catholics. It is about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ bringing you into heaven. That is what Paul is saying. And after he says this for three chapters, he says, for him and by him and in him are all things. All things are from God because he's our creator. God is the ruler and governor of this universe. So no matter what happens to you, good or bad, it is his will. It is in his providence. And in God, because they are directed to his honor and glory, we need to appreciate no matter what our circumstances may be. Because for him and by him and in him are all things. God, generally. When we look at Mass, particularly when those words are used in Mass, the Holy Spirit has directed the church to use the words of God himself in doxology for what we receive in Holy Mass. That is when we hear, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, be all honor and glory now and forever, world without end. Amen. We are using the words that the Holy Spirit gave us to give God perfect thanks for the perfect work done by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Mass. Let's focus on the canon of the Mass. If you look at the canon of the Mass, the canon of the Mass is about Christ's suffering. It is not the happy communion meal. It is about the God-man's body being broken, every drop of precious blood in his veins being shed for our sins. That is what the canon of the Mass is all about. Hence, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. When we look at that holy sacrifice, we talk about and pray about that God may receive this, these oblations, these sacrifices that we offer him. And it is ultimately after our Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the words of institution by the priest, when bread becomes the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the wine becomes the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that chalice, in that chalice that sits on the altar, it's so beautiful, and it should be because of what it contains. It contains divinity. That's why it has to be precious. That's why it is such a travesty if it is wooden or glass or something that is substandard material. It should be gold. And if the best you can do is silver, the cup itself should be lined with gold. Historically, those are the rules because of what it contains. That chalice is the chalice of suffering. That, has, that whole concept has been lost over the past 60 years. It's not denied. It's just not talked about. We don't talk about the holy sacrifice of the mass. We don't talk about that. It's the communion meal. No. That chalice contains the body and blood of the God-man. And when the canon of the mass reaches its crescendo because we talk about the sufferings of our Lord, his body broken, his blood being shed out. That's what our prayers speak. We reach the point where Christ dies, where Christ is dead. The visual of, you don't see it from where you are, the visual of the chalice containing the blood of Christ and the host on the patent or on the corporal that sits there. The separation, the blood, every drop has been shed for us. 
the body has been broken for us and lays on an altar, an altar of sacrifice. When all that is complete and our Lord breathes his last, then comes or should come our thanksgiving for what he has done for us. That thanksgiving starts, and it, you can see this depending on where you're seated, how far back you are, where your angle is, but what you should see, what has traditionally been presented at this point of doxology when our Lord is dead, is this chalice of suffering, which is covered with a pall. The pall is removed by the celebrant or the deacon of the mass. The pall is removed. Like, okay, you're going to do something with the chalice. That's why it's removed. No. It illustrates two things, particularly, very, very succinctly and profoundly. One is that everything in the Old Testament, all the prophecies, all the kings, all the priests, all this stuff that was shadow, we know now with clarity. You know, because for them it was, how are we going to be saved? God's going to provide a Messiah. Who is it? What does he have to do for us? What's it going to look like? It looks like that. It's the broken body and shed blood of the God-man. And now it's contained in the chalice on our altar. And it is uncovered and what was hidden is now revealed. To us, the removal of the pall. That removal of the pall is also indicative of when the veil is rent in two at the moment our Lord dies. When he breathes his last and gives his this spirit up to God who gave it, the veil of the temple is torn in two. Up to that point, only Levitical priests could go in. Only the high priest, once a year, could go into the Holy of Holies. Our Lord, because of his sacrifice, has rent that veil in two. There's no longer a veil over it. We can all go to the throne of grace. We can all pray directly to God. We don't need this, these various and sundry, human, fallible, sinful intermediaries. We have a perfect mediator, the God-man Jesus Christ. He is now revealed. The veil is torn. The covering is gone. Hence the pall is removed. And then the priest, whereas up to this point in the mass, during the consecrations, the priest acting in persona Christi has blessed the chalice and the elements with his hand. Blessings of the bread, blessing of the chalice, all the blessings done with the priest's hands. This is too important to be done by some human being even acting in persona Christi. These crosses that are made traditionally over the chalice, three of them, by him and with him and in him, are made with the body of Christ, the host. He is the one who is immolated for us. He is the one who has suffered for us. He is the one whose body has been broken and blood shed out for us. Hence, the blessing over that chalice of suffering are made with Jesus Christ himself. Because what we are doing is thanking God in the most perfect way to thank God is with his son. Our prayers and our thanksgiving are tainted because of our sin. A perfect thanksgiving has to be given by God himself and our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who over the chalice of suffering by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty. God the Holy Spirit and God the Father are blessed. There are not crosses made over the chalice of suffering for the Holy Spirit or for God the Father because they did not suffer for us. God the Father did not suffer. God the Son or God the Holy Spirit did not suffer. The Son suffered for us. Hence, by him and with him and in him, Jesus Christ, be all honor and glory to thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Those signs of the cross over the chalice and those two that are made outside of the chalice, but made with the body of Christ himself, 
it communicates to us very, very simply a very, very perfect summary of our faith in Jesus Christ. By him, by Jesus Christ, we go to the Father in the Mass. That's the only way we can go to the Father. Not by Muhammad, not by Buddha, not by law-keeping of Moses, but by Jesus Christ and him alone. That's what your faith teaches. By him, Jesus Christ. With him, Jesus Christ. With him, the whole mystical body of our Lord, of, of our Lord in this world, us, are taken up to heaven spiritually, literally. At the Mass, I always emphasize that the barriers of time and space go away, and we are taken up into the heavenlies where we are with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. That is what's going on there, with Christ, because that's the only way we can get there now, is spiritually in union with him, and then in Christ. Even here in this world, we are in Christ. We are grafted, we are, we are part of the vine, we are branches of that vine. By Jesus Christ and with Jesus Christ, and in Jesus Christ be all honor and glory to thee, O Father Almighty, in unity of the Holy Ghost, be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The symbolism of what is going on there, because at those last words, the priest places the chalice of suffering back on the altar, and it is finished. The suffering is over and the pall is replaced over the chalice of suffering. At that part of the Mass, Jesus Christ is dead. He is dead in his body. And again, the interesting visual of the fact that his soul has been separated from his body and now is with the Father for the three days he lies in the tomb. When that pall is placed back over the chalice of suffering, that's the rock that is placed over the tomb of our Lord. And then Mass continues. It is no longer the canon, but Mass continues with prayers in our anticipation of receiving the resurrected Lord under the forms sacramentally of bread and wine. That's what's going on there. Now you can see it every single week. You can hear those words as many times as you go to Mass, and they can be meaningless. And by meaningless, I mean, yeah, I hear them, okay, I'll be here next week. That's the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Those words can be, I hear them all the time, and I try to pay attention, but, you know, I do think about this and think about this, you know, I'm distracted. Or it can be like Peter. We can cooperate and be attentive to what's going on at Mass, learn about it, understand the depth and the profound nature of this sacrifice of our Lord, and understand that we are in a very real sense, every single time we come to Mass, representing the cross, not a crucifix, but the cross of the true God-man who hung nailed to that cross for our sins. And when the priest says, world without end, uh, that means it is continual. It is that everlasting covenant of the shed blood and broken body of our Lord that gets us into heaven. I struggle sometimes personally with which mass is better, the divine worship that we use or the old Latin mass. They're close. There are some high points for both. Both have their pros and cons as far, I'm, as, far as I'm concerned. This is a place the, that, that differs between the two subtly. That I, I, It's a real struggle for me because I like the fact that the faithful here, by him and with him and in him, because if you know what's going on, it is something that jogs the memory. It's something that is that you hear. You're not just reading it, you know, you can follow along by doing that, but you hear it and you experience it by hearing it. In the old Latin Mass, you don't hear those words. You don't hear any words of the canon in the old Latin Mass. 
the first audible words that you hear is after this doxology when the celebrant says per omnia secula seculorum. Those are the first audible words that are uttered. And those first audible words are that cry that our Lord gave out when everything was finished and he gave up his spirit to his father. So you see the two, they both have some good things going for them. I don't think it's a matter of good or bad. It's like better, this is better in this, and this is better in that. Nothing's bad, but there's some better qualities in one and better qualities in another. But that, the, the, in the old traditional Latin mass, when everything has been silent, and the priest utters those words, per omnia secula seculorum, world without end. We know everything is finished for us. We know that the promises are going to be fulfilled if we maintain a life of faith and obedience. In this doxology we give, because the thanksgiving that we're giving for God right there is with his words, with his body, with his broken body and shed blood and to God himself. We're not involved in the whole thing except joining our hearts and giving thanks. It's that, that whole part of the mass is called the minor elevation and because the, the, the chalice is picked up just about chest height for the celebrant. World without end and then it's placed back down. It is for Jesus. It is for God. It's all about him. There's another point when the, the major elevation in the mass where the body of our Lord is elevated as high as the celebrant can possibly do it. And then the chalice is elevated. That's for you. That's for you to worship Jesus Christ objectively under the sacramental forms. It is for you to worship him. The minor elevation, which is over a thousand years older than the major elevation that is there for us, the church has always emphasized this minor elevation. Again, not minor because it's less than, minor because it's not that high, because the altar is Jesus Christ. The chalice of suffering is the chalice of suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one through whom we are giving thanks to the Father. It's all about God, and it's all about his mercy. That's why I said earlier that it is probably, if not the, obviously, one of the most profound points in the Mass, because we know everything is accomplished for us. It is the perfect summary of the doctrine of Jesus Christ that ends the canon. In that doxology that we use, for him and by him and with him are all things, that is the perfect expression of praise for our lives every single day. Not just at Mass, every single day. If something really good happens, it's easy to say it. By him and with him and in him are all things. But I would actually say even more so when something really horrible happens in your life to be able to bow your head and when your mind's not working as to how you could actually pray for this horrible situation, to just let your memory think of the mass and, say, and give him thanks for being the God who he is and say by him and with him and in him, be all honor and glory, world without end, amen. That's why we should learn things like that. Because I said in the mass, when you hear that from henceforth, I pray you are a little bit more attentive to it because it is the perfect summary of the doctrine of Jesus Christ that culminates in his sacrifice for us and ends the canon. It is also the perfect expression of praise for our lives and no matter what may be going on. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.